Hello, and welcome to the COVID-19 edition of Genomics at Home for Walden's Macroglobulin Evia. I'm really sorry I can't be there in person to, to explain this stuff and talk with each one of you. It's uh, a fortunate fallout from the pandemic. However, uh, I will be around after this presentation to do a Q&A section live over Zoom. And for those of you coming across this video uh, at a later date, feel free to reach out to me anytime. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about the genomics of Waldenstrom's and how that is being played out in, in terms of how we're developing new therapies and new techniques to care for WM patients. But before we go there, we first need to make sure that we understand the basic concepts of modern genetics. Now, it's not so bad, and the thing I want everyone to repeat again and again and again in their head, like a mantra, is genomics is easy. So let's try it all together. Genomics is easy, genomics is easy, genomics is easy, because it is, it really is. Now, before we go any further, my name is Zachary Hunter, and I work at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute uh, in the Bing Center for Waldenstrom's Macroglobulinemia with Steve Trion and Jorge Castillo. And uh, we've really been a dedicated Waldenstrom's research group now for uh, well over a decade. And it's uh, really our, our, our honor and privilege to be able to share some of our progress and really summarize progress that's been made from people around the world. Uh, and as a community effort. So again, before we go too much further, we first need to stop and understand basic genomics and genetics. For many of you, this may be new. And I include myself when I say that you know, the biology I learned in high school has actually changed pretty significantly. So that's okay. But again, remember, it's not so complicated. Just remember that mantra and you'll be just fine. And the thing to remember here is that DNA is a very, very simple molecule. It's exactly four parts in long strings, and that's it, right? That's all genetics right there. Four different types of uh, components in very long strings. So what are those components? They're called nucleotides. Uh, they're abbreviated A, T, C, and G. And one of the really remarkable things about DNA is that it's incredibly stable and well-designed. And so, and one of the reasons this is true is the G's and the C's pair to together in a very stable way. And the A's and T's also pair together in this very stable way. And what this means is we can construct two long strands of DNA that are complementary to each other, that sort of fit like this, uh, this example, like a ladder right here over uh, on the left of the screen. This structure is important because not only does it make the, the molecule very stable and resistant to chemical attack, it also means that if something were to go wrong, let's say something were to delete one of the bases, you could use the other strand to successfully replicate or repair the other one. And so this is, again, one of the ways that the cells can use the structure of DNA to help maintain its integrity and pass it from generation to generation to generation. And this is actually really the information we're inheriting from our parents, and that makes us who we are. Now, DNA is not you. It's not uh, gonna decide whether you like coffee or tea, if you're a fan of chocolate milk or not, uh, doesn't determine really very much about you. What it is, is instructions and building blocks to make you, right? And help you respond to your environment. And how you respond to your environment and how you interact with your environment then becomes a dynamic process that actually will evolve organically over time. And this is one of the reasons why identical twins in long-term twin studies start off incredibly similar, very hard to tell apart, very similar personalities, but towards the end of their lives actually wind up quite different. Now, if this is a master blueprint and has all the instructions to make you, you, well, you know, you want to be pretty careful with it, right? And so you don't want to be sending your instruct your one copy of your instructions out all over your cell to try to go and like do this, do that, repair this, make this new protein. So DNA itself is not used to do the heavy lifting. Copies of it are made, little short copies, because there's sections of DNA that actually encode for different instructions. So you want a particular thing done, you find that piece of DNA, you make a copy of it, and you send that out into the cell, and the cell will read the, the instructions and respond appropriately. And these copies, these little short uh, bits of instructions are called RNA. 
and it's a very similar molecule to DNA. It also is made up of nucleotides A, T, or A, C, and G. The T has actually been substituted for U's. You'll see that in this diagram. Uh, it's uracil. You can basically forget about it. It's not that important, but just know it's there. And if you see the U's, don't get confused. Now, for those of you who are wondering about what this means and how this works, you've probably heard about genes and the importance of genes. Genes are just sections of the DNA that encode for instructions. So sections of the DNA that have instructions that are telling the cell how to respond to their environment, how to build things, are genes. And they're transcribed and sent out into the cell using RNA. And that's it. That's really the whole thing. So now that we've got that covered, let's talk about what some of the consequences of this are. For starters, this used to be literally how we would go and think about doing genomics. When I was in high school, I got a, uh, an opportunity to work at Harvard University and, uh, and do some genomic sequencing in yeast. And we used to have these big, huge uh, photographic plates and we'd tile them all from the ceiling all the way down to the floor, trying to read them out, literally like A, T, C, E, G. It was very, very slow. Because I can tell you, in a human being, there are three billion base pairs in the human genome. And you actually have two copies, one from each parent. So reading it this way takes a long time, but that's the way it used to be done. Luckily, we now have computers. And actually computers are a pretty good analogy for this. For those of you who are wondering like, well, how can you go from something that's so simple as like four letters in a long string? Well, actually computers and computer programs are really two letters in a long string, right? Ones and zeros. Uh, technically a series of logic gates, trues and false. Now, computers are based, again, on this much more simple, simpler version of DNA, but as you know, they can actually do some very complicated things. As a matter of fact, when you get enough of those ones and zeros together, you can make things like IBM's Watson, which was able to beat all the human players in Jeopardy. Pretty impressive. So with four bases, imagine what you can do. And especially in the case with human beings, because you have, again, three billion of these letters, right, in 23 long strands called chromosomes. And you have two copies of each one, one from each parent. So this is a lot of information that you get to work with. And that's one of the reasons that we can do so many interesting and complicated things. So let's just review this all together. You have DNA, it's your master uh, blueprint, has all the instructions, how to do everything, when to, when to do it, how to respond to the environment. Sections of the DNA that encode for those instructions are called genes and they're transcribed in RNA. And the RNA can do many things, but its principal thing is actually to encode for protein. And protein is long chains of something called amino acids, which you've probably heard about in your doctor's office or in health you know, supplements, commercials and things like that. But uh, Amino acids are strung together to make proteins, and proteins are really what do the work in the cell. They, they help break things down, build things up, construct things, move things around. Um, and all together, it allows the cell, again, to function and respond to its environment. Now, I said that, you know, DNA is encoding instructions on how to do things. That's a little bit hand wavy, right? I mean, it's magic right you know it's just like hey like it does it you have four letters and then you wind up with cool cells so how does that work again turns out it's not that hard so basically the dna is actually read in groups of three they're called codons and so three nucleotides in a row encode for a single amino acid so when you look at instructions a set of instructions in the rna that rna is really just read in groups of three saying, okay, start with this amino acid, then add this one, then add this one, then add this one, then add this one, so on and so forth until you're done. And that code is pretty simple. And you can look at the, this is a little uh, amino acid coding wheel. And so we can say, let's say the DNA has a, a codon that says CTC. Let's look at this in the wheel, right? We have C, now Ts become Us and RNA. There's our T and then C, well, hey, that's leucine, cool. All right, now what if there was a change? Let's say the cell made a mistake and there was a mutation in the DNA. And instead of a T, it's now a C. So it's at the DNA level, it's now C, C, C. Let's look and see what that does. We have C, C, 
see, well, that's proline. So by changing the code at the DNA level, we've now changed the composition of this gene from encoding from a leucine to a proline. So it'll still be built, but it'll now have a different amino acid incorporated into it. Now, another thing that you're gonna hear about in terms of mutations are something called frame shifts. Now, this is a, a slightly more complicated thing until you understand how codons work. So let's look at this little snippet of DNA code. GAT, GAT, TAC, CTG. We can use our handy amino acid wheel here to go and actually translate this. And the single letter amino acid code for this is DDYL. Okay, cool. What were to happen if we were to not just replace one of these nucleotides, but just accidentally skip over it? Like let's say we're making a copy and we just simply forgot to add it. Well, this does happen. And to be fair, right? You're making two copies of three billion things, of six billion things. Maybe you skip it in a nucleotide or two. It could happen. It's impressive it works as well as it does. So if we were to lose, let's say this G, this would result in a frame shift. Because it used to be that G was in the first position in the codon, A was in the second, and T was in the third. But now A is in the first position, T is in the second position, G is now was in the was in the first position of the second codon, it's now in the third. So instead of just changing the one amino acid, like a point mutation did in the last example, everything has now been shifted. Right? And so now it the codons are ATG, ATT, ACC, TGC, which goes to MITC in amino acid code, entirely different. And so these are incredibly damaging when they occur. If you lose a group of three codons or nucleotides, like a complete codon, that's an in frame deletion. So you'll lose just that one amino acid. If it's not a multiple of three, however, you'll get these frame shifts where everything downstream is effectively scrambled. Again, this is really important, and we're going to run into these in a little bit in Wallenstrom's when we talk about CXCR4 mutations. Now, one of the things I haven't talked about, I've used very big numbers, like 3 billion, and actually technically 3 billion times 2, since you have two copies. Well, we haven't really talked about how big that is. Billion is a big thing. It's a lot of zeros. Turns out, if you were to go and you were to string this all end to end, you're looking at about 40 inches of DNA. That's a lot of DNA, right? And you have that wrapped up into every single cell in your body, not just into every single cell, actually into a subcompartment of every single cell called the nucleus. Again, this is your master blueprint for how to do everything. You want to protect it. And the nucleus or the nuclear envelope that wraps around it helps control that environment and make sure it stays safe. The copies are then made and sent out of the nucleus to do the work. So, that's what, so all the RNA is actually made in the nucleus and then sent out uh, inside of it. But 40 inches in every single cell, I mean, that is some impressive, impressive compression. I mean, I wish I could get my computer programs to do that. Now, this has both features and complications. In fact, it's so tightly wound up that the DNA is effectively invisible. Nothing can interact with it uh, unless it's partially unwound. And this actually maybe answers a question that you know, some of you may have already thought about, which is if the DNA in my body is the same, right? In your nose and your eyes and your heart, your liver, why did those different parts of your body respond so differently to, different, to the same stimulus? Well, that's because they effectively have different DNA. They don't see the whole thing, they only see parts of it. Different parts are unwound in different cell types letting them have effectively different genomes. So they will respond differently because they have a different sets of genes that they're allowed to use. So by controlling which parts of the genome are unwound, you can actually see, basically say which programs are available to any individual cell. There's even additional levels of regulation past that. You can chemically annotate parts of the DNA that will make it harder for protein and other chemicals to interact with it. And these are called methyl groups. They're small chemical uh, groups that can be attached to the DNA. And once that, that ability to bind to the DNA is inhibited, a protein that might normally, for instance, turn on a gene or block a gene from being used, 
uh, or cause it to wind up or do any number of different item, um, actions, that protein can now no longer interact with that section of the DNA, effectively silencing it. And so this is another really important thing that can determine what cells are allowed to see and what they're allowed to use. Now, in the context of cancer, of course, all of these things can go wrong. And in fact, they do. And this is one of the interesting things about modern biology is for the first time, we can actually start to measure these things, which is really great because in isolation, it can be very hard to understand what the significance of, of one of these events are. So we can look at, for instance, changes in the DNA, and that would be changes in the genome. And we actually can do whole genome sequencing and have done it on WM patients. And that's actually what led to the discovery of mid-88 and CX04 and the 6Q deletions we'll talk about later. We can also talk about the transcriptome. And that's a, a measurement of all the RNA that's being used at a particular moment in the cell. And this is really great because it lets us understand how genes are being used in a cell at a given point in time. And finally, you have the proteome. And the proteome is actually that the proteins that have been made by the cell and are, and we can look at how they've been modified, what they're doing, where they're located. This gives us a lot of clues to what the cell is experiencing and how it is processing and responding to its environment. And finally, we have the epigenome, right? And this is, again, that folding or unwinding of the DNA and also the chemical annotations that are on it. We can also measure which proteins are actually bound to DNA at any given uh, time and where they're bound. And this gives us, again, really important information about the regulation and usage of genes uh, in a cell at a particular moment in time. And by putting all these things together, we can understand how cells are responding to their environment, how they've changed in the context of cancer, and gives us some ideas about what we can do to interfere with these processes to help block the cancer without hurting you, the patient. And so this would be a really good time to switch gears and talk about the genomics of WM. So I know I've mentioned this in passing, but I just want to say it again. Cancer is a tricky disease because it actually is originally part of yourself. What happens is that as accidental mistakes and changes occur in the DNA, we call them mutations, they'll accumulate over time. And this is normal and it just happens. And normally what happens is the DNA is either repaired or the cell is identified as being injured and it gets taken out, but sometimes they don't. And this can cause the cell to lose some functions or gain some functions. And if enough of these mutations accumulate, it can lose the ability to self-regulate and it'll start to grow out of control. And when that happens, we call it cancer. So mutations in the DNA and changes in all these different ohms that we just talked about really are what lead to cancer. And understanding these interactions are really the key to developing new therapies and new ways of treating patients. So what is the most famous mutation in Waldstrom? That's probably the one in MYD88, and it's that L265P mutation that many of you have probably heard of. So for those of you who are curious, that's the same mutation we talked about in the earlier example, the leucine to proline substitution. It actually really is a T to a C substitution in just one nucleotide in the entire genome. Now, what is MYD88? Well, MYD88 is a part of uh, your immune response, or at least that's what it's supposed to be doing. So your immune system is broken up into two pieces. One is your acquired immune system. And this is what, for instance, keeps you from getting the same thing twice, is very, very smart and adaptive and learns how to fight a specific disease. But you also need sort of like a first responder, like very quick, quick and agile response for your immune system that maybe isn't so specific. And that's your innate immunity. And that's really where mid plays an important role in biology. What happens is you have sensors that are designed to detect really common patterns in bacteria and viruses. Doesn't know anything other than the fact that that pattern was detected, but it lets your immune system know that there's a problem and will send out sort of an inflammatory signal to let cells get geared up to fight it and also to tell it where it was seen and help cells traffic to that location. So, these receptors, when they're activated, will naturally cause two copies of MYD88 to come together. Now, what, this is called dimerization. You'll hear about mediated dimerization sometimes uh, in talks or Wallenstrom's. 
But this dimerization or two copies coming together will cause a bunch of other molecules to start to aggregate around that core of uh, mid-88 and form a large signaling complex called the mitosome. This includes ARAC, A4, and 1, and BTK. Now, this you don't need to sweat the details here, but ARAC4 and 1 will signal down and ultimately activate a complex called NF-kappa-B. Now, NF-kappa-B does exactly what you expect um, a molecule responsible for detecting, let's say, an active infection would to do, which is it helps the cell grow and survive. And most importantly, it helps promote inflammation. So this is letting the rest of your immune system know that there is a problem and that uh, it needs to get geared up to fight and help these cells fight off whatever bacteria and virus was just observed. So in, the problem with this L265P mutation in Wallenstrom's is that it allows mitigate to come together even when the receptors are active. So it will just stay active all the time, no matter what, and have this constant inflammatory signaling, which is actually explains many of the symptoms that Wallenstrom's patients feel when they have active disease. The tiredness, the sweating, the fatigue, a lot of these are symptoms of inflammation. And it's being driven by YD88 in, uh, down through this thing called NF-kappa-B. Now, you can actually see uh, in cell lines, we can, we can put a dye on NF-kappa-B that's green and a dye on the nuclear envelope that's blue. And we can see that all the green dots in our uh, cell line, BCW1, are actually inside the nucleus bound to DNA. That means that sort of pro-inflammation program is being activated. If we put in a mid-88 inhibitor, which I wish we could do in patients, but unfortunately we can't. Um, we can only do it in a test tube. But when we do it, we can actually kick all those green dots out of the nucleus away from the DNA, and the cells will eventually die. And this is a really important discovery. And this is now really the basis for a lot of the uh, WM-specific treatments that are in development. Now, if people are feeling a little overwhelmed, they're probably remembering what I said in the very beginning. Didn't I promise this would be easy? This diagram doesn't look easy. And fair enough. As a matter of fact, uh, the other year, Steve and I actually did a lecturing tour for doctors over in Europe, uh, trying to explain about the basic science of WM and how to treat it. And one of the most consistent feedback pieces that I got was that this diagram was really confusing to the cancer specialists, right? These are like highly trained hematologists and doctors. One of the interesting things about being a biologist is what you have to learn is sort of an ability to pay attention to just the details that matter. In this case, all we really need to know is that mid-88 activates uh, ARAC41, BTK, and ultimately activates NF-kappa-B, which binds to the DNA and causes growth, survival, and activates a sort of pro-inflammation immune response uh, in, within the cell by binding to the DNA. Now, this simple diagram, you know, shown over here, is perfectly sufficient, right? But we are skipping over a bunch of steps. And so at the point where they're more interested in the understanding, well, hmm, what can we target in this pathway that would maybe allow us to block mediate signaling? Looking at the more complex diagram, we can see the mediate dimerization, we can understand, well, hey, maybe if we could block mediate from binding to itself, maybe that would be a good therapy. And as a matter of fact, people are trying to do that. We can understand um, the paper, for instance, by Steve Ansel, targeting TAC1 and Wallenstrom's. You can understand why that matters and where TAC1 fits in, in the context of uh, Wallenstrom's therapy and in the signaling cascade relative to mid-88. Turns out we don't have good enough drugs right now for that to be a good target, but it's definitely something that we can keep in the mix and think about and also makes sense of you know, this slightly more complex diagram. Now, even this is skipping over a ton of information. And when we need it, it's good to know that that stuff is there and we dig into it when necessary. But there's so much to know and there's so many complicated interactions. Most of what we care about is just the interactions between the major players and maintain that ability to move from the simple to the complex to the deep dive and back and forth very easily. So don't be overwhelmed by these diagrams. Don't worry about them. Just remember the major players that people are, are talking about. So in this case, MYD8 being connected to this activation of NF-kappa-B 
and the growth survival inflammation signaling within the nucleus. Now, this mutation that we've observed in MYD88 has been validated by people all over the world. And it looks like about 95% of all of these patients have it. We use the most sensitive uh, detection technology. And we've also managed to make a number of important discoveries related to this pathway. In particular, I'd like to highlight one of my colleagues, Guang Yang, who's really just, just brilliant scientist, and he'll come up again in a minute. But he discovered that uh, unlike what was classically described, MYD8 signaling through Iraq 4, it also signaled through BTK. And this is really important because BTK is not only active, but it was actually the vast majority of signaling is coming not through the Iraqs, but through this alternate BTK pathway in Wallenstrom's. And there is a drug to block BTK called abrutinib. So BTK stands for abrutinib tyrosine kinase. And there's now not just abrutinib, there's acalabrutinib, xanabrutinib, and many others that are coming down the pike, many of which are now shown to work in Wallenstrom's. Abrutinib itself was actually approved by the FDA as the first therapy approved specifically for Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. It's true in Canada as well as the European Union. Um, and it's really now in very widespread use. And now you can understand why that's true and how it works and where it fits in with this mediate mutation. The other big mutations that we see are in a gene called CX04. Now this is about 30 to 40% of patients and they all occur in this tail end of the protein here. So unlike mediate, where they're basically all happening in the same spot, these are a bunch of different mutations that occur in a, one central area of the protein. So the interesting thing about this is that uh, it has a very distinct clinical phenotype. So it's associated with high IgM and hyperviscosity, uh, especially for those, actually increased bone marrow involvement for those people who at least have the um, truncating or nonsense mutations. These are point mutations that sort of terminate um, the protein translation uh, that have been created within this C-terminal tail. But, um, but in fact, when we look at the protein level, we can, in the actual 3D structure, we can sort of start to understand the actual function of these mutations and why they work the way they do. So if you look at the three-dimensional diagram here, you can actually see two different copies of CX04. And these are actually sticking through the cell membrane with this part up here actually looking for a signal and this part down here sticking into the cell and actually propagating that signal uh, down into the nucleus ultimately uh, through something called uh, G-coupled proteins. So these are really uh, an important signaling cascade that, um, that actually can play a very important role in Walton's macroglobulinemia. Now, these mutations all occur on this little tail that's sticking out from the protein right here. Now, that tail actually doesn't impact the signaling particularly. It can bind to the, you know, to the things it's looking for and it can signal into the cell without that tail. What the tail does is once that receptor is activated, it helps pull it inside the cell again to reset the receptor and stop the signal. These, what all these different mutations do is they either scramble the tail through frame shift mutations or truncate it. And once that tail is gone or scrambled, it can no longer be used to internalize the protein and it just sits there in the cell and signals and signals and signals constitutively. So it's worth taking a moment and think, okay, well, that's great, but what does CXCR4 do? It's actually part of a family of proteins that are called chemokines receptors. And these chemokine receptors are used to help cells move through the body and know where to go. So they'll follow a chemical signal through a gradient kind of like a nose, right? Sniffing to find the source of a scent. And it'll help the cell get to where they need to go. And one of the places where you get a lot of uh, high concentrations of what CXCR4 is looking for is actually in the bone marrow, which should make a lot of sense to those of you who have Wallenstrom's macroglobulinemia and know that your bone marrow gets chock full of these Wallenstrom cells. So we think that this is definitely playing a role in that. And um, another interesting thing that's worth mentioning is a lot of this ability to move through the body and navigate is mediated not just through CXCR4, but also through Bruton's tyrosine kinase, or BTK. That's, that's not the only thing that CXCR4 does. It also uh, activates a number of very important uh, pathways that are related to uh, particularly cellular survival and health. 
and helps them uh, resist sort of chemical attack and other things. And this has some implications for Wallenstein's therapy. As many of you know, those people with CXCR4 mutations actually don't respond quite as well to certain therapies, in most famously to the BTK inhibitor abrutinib. As you can see, well, they do actually have really nice responses. So this is an over, with a median of just over 50% uh, reduction in IgM. It both takes much longer for patients to get there, um, and it doesn't last as long. These are some of the first patients to come off. Now, it still lasts for years, and they're still getting very good responses. They're just not as deep, and they don't last quite as long as those patients who uh, lack CXCR4 mutations. And so that's a really important message. It's not that it's a bad therapy for CXCR4 mutated individuals, it's just it's not as good as it is for those people who are um, missing CXCR4 mutations. And it's just something, again, to know and think about and include in the mix when you're considering um, what, uh, what therapies to use. Now, it also presents an opportunity. What if we could block CXCR4 signaling chemically? Could we turn these people uh, who have the CXCR4 mutations to be effectively like the CX people who lack CXCR4 mutations? And we're actually doing that clinical trial right now. It's currently being, in, uh, patients are being followed up and it's in analysis and the results definitely are very intriguing and will be presented soon. Uh, but we do hope to start bringing on targeted CXC4 uh, therapies for patients with these mutations and wands from sometime in the near future. Now, we talked about CXC4 and MYD88, but there are these 5% of people who don't have MYD88 mutations. They still have Wallenstrom's and the cells still act and look like Wallenstrom's cells, but they don't have MYD88. Uh, they do sometimes have CXCR4. It's not that common, but they can have them. Um, but to understand this, we actually did a study uh, collecting a bunch of these patients and going over and looking, seeing what mutations they did have. And again, a lot of things in the NF-kappa B pathway, again, mirroring what we observe with MYD88, but in this case, much lower in the chain. So things that are well, much, much closer to the actual activation of NF-kappa B itself. And uh, a lot of NF-kappa B negative regulators for instance, are being removed or modified in different ways. These are also a bunch of mutations that are common to a related disease called uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And uh, this is particularly interesting because um, we actually see that uh, a much higher rate of transformation into aggressive lymphoma in these patients with um, wild type or non-mutated MYD88. Now, if we look at our diagram here, looking at MYD88 and BTK um, and its role in signaling, we've shown all the locations and mutations for uh, the wild type or again, unmutated MYD88 here in the diagram. And you can see they're all below BTK in this chain of signals. And this is important because it means that we could inhibit BTK all day and it would not impact the signaling related to these mutations even one bit. And this explains why we don't typically observe great responses in the context of maybe a wild type or unmutated uh, Walsh's macroglobulin anemia. So it may be that some BTK, um, the BTK inhibition will work for some patients, but for the vast majority of patients without the mediate mutation, uh, we've not really observed great responses and it's not something that we would recommend at this time patients pursuing, and this is why. Now, after showing you all this information, it's important to note that there are some real clinical differences in terms of the overall course of the disease. Interestingly, despite the fact that the CXCR4 mutated individuals don't respond as well to therapies and seem to progress off faster, their differences in overall survival don't actually seem to be uh, very significant compared to those people lacking CXCR4 but having the eight mutations. Those who lack mitigate mutations are the ones who have a slightly more aggressive course. Um, and again, this is largely being driven by this transformation into a more aggressive type of lymphoma called diffuse large B cell lymphoma that definitely needs some more uh, stronger therapy and slightly different care uh, than Wallenstrom's macroglobulin anemia. But again, it's just something to, to be aware of. Another interesting thing about these different genotypes, and this is just a way of saying the mutational profile of different types of Waldenstroms is that they, um, they're also associated with slightly different stages of uh, cell development. So B cells in normal biology are supposed to uh, help you fight, a, fight specific infections. Uh, same kind of um, 
cells that help you fight off things that you've already seen. So you get a particular version of the flu, for instance, and get exposed to it again, you actually have a B cell which has a memory of that and knows how to fight it and gets reactivated um, and will help you fight it very, very quickly and is why you won't get it a second time. Now, what happens is when they get activated, and they, 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 which means that they know how to fight something and they're being told, okay, you know how to do this, let's go fight it. They transform from something that's a B cell into something that's called a plasma cell. And these are uh, professional producers of things called antibodies. And antibodies are one of the chemicals that we use to fight off uh, specific diseases. And they're custom basically made just to fight off that particular disease. Now, Wallenstrom's are, is an interesting disease because the cells are stuck sort of halfway through the transition from a B cell to a plasma cell. And one of the things we learned from looking at the, and studying sort of RNA profile or the sort of transcriptional gene usage uh, of Wallenstrom cells is that depending on what mutations you have, the cells are either closer or further away from actually successfully making that transition to a plasma cell. So those people who have mediate mutations but lack CXCR4 are shown in red, and they're very close to being plasma cells. Those patients who have um, CXCR4 mutations are a little further away, and those who have lack mediate mutations are the closest to being uh, regular, uh, regular B cells. Now you can see regular B cells, our healthy donor plasma cells, and there's our increasing levels of B cell differentiation. Now, the last mutation I'd like to talk about are those uh, somatic deletions, or these are acquired deletions on chromosome six. So this is a chromosomes are just long strands of DNA, and we just number them by size, uh, one to 23, with the last ones actually being X and Y. So it's one to 22 plus X and Y, and those are sex specific chromosomes. Now, what happens is that sometimes whole chunks of a chromosome just go missing. And that's what happens with 6Q and Wallenstrom's. And uh, we were trying to understand what they were and uh, what areas are being lost, what's important about it, and how it relates to the wall development of Wallenstrom's macroglobulin anemia. And to do this, I was working with Maria Luisa Guerrero, who's a wonderful uh, postdoc from Italy, who's been working with us for a number of years. And she focused on a number of genes that we had identified from our whole genome sequencing effort and had gone through to study them specifically in the context of Wallenstrom's to understand the depth of the deletions of how many cells in the Wallenstrom cell uh, clone actually carried these deletions uh, and how it related to the stage of Wallenstrom's and also the presence of other mutations like CXCR4 and MYBVA. And one thing she discovered is that there was a subgroup of patients who lost all of 6Q and uh, in at least one copy of the 6Q and it really didn't matter whether they're asymptomatic or symptomatic, but what did matter is whether or not they had a CXCR4 mutation. So those people who didn't have CXCR4 mutations were much more likely to have these big losses of 6Q. Um, those people who had CXCR4 were much less likely to have anything like that. And those people who lacked MYD88 mutations uh, didn't have any evidence of 6Q deletions whatsoever at all. And so this was pretty interesting to us. So we started to dig into this and study it a little bit. And one of the things we discovered is that there was a very similar set of genes that were being dysregulated in chromosome 6Q deletions and uh, CXCR4 mutations. Even though the two mutations are not uh, located in the same part of your DNA, they were impacting a similar set of genes and they're all changing in a very similar way. And we can even see at the protein level, and these are, again, this is a bone marrow slide, um, from an actual WM patient, and you can see one of the target proteins really being increased in the case of uh, CXCR4 wild type and then being silenced again in the presence of a CXCR4 mutation. And again, this is the actual transcription levels, and this is the protein levels being detected using a technique called immunohistochemistry. And this tells us that the 6Q and CXCR4 mutations are doing something similar and have a similar role in having W and how WM advances and becomes a more malignant or active disease over time. So we think that this is one of the events that happens really from the sort of pre-WM MGAS stage into the asymptomatic but active WM. So uh, it's very exciting and we now believe that these genes in particular uh, may hold the key for us to understand uh, what we need to target to block this transition moving forward.
The last thing I'd like to talk about is, um, again, a discovery from uh, my friend and colleague, Guang Yang, who again is really just this absolutely brilliant scientist. And he was able to show that this MYDA and kappa B cascade that we talked about wasn't just promoting inflammation, it was also leading to the activation of an important molecule called HCK. And the HCK itself was activating BTK, sort of reinforcing that mitigate signal. And not only was it doing that, it was also responsible for the activation of something called ERK-1-2 signaling, as well as PI3K AKT. These are not things you need to remember, but these are really important growth and survival uh, compounds that, that the cells need. The long just simply need it. And as a matter of fact, he was able to show that we could rescue cells who are, whose BTK had basically been blocked by one of these drugs by reactivating HCK by itself. And that's really amazing. And so we're now trying to look at uh, the role of HCK inhibitors, uh, looking at this cascade that HCK is kicking off to see if we can come up with new and better therapies or combination therapies to target Wallenstrom's macroglobulinemia. So just to review, we have uh, MYD8 signaling caused by a mutation driving NF-kappa B. We can block this with drugs like abrutinib, acalabrutinib, xanabrutinib, and other agents targeting that pathway. Uh, we didn't talk about it, but this does lead to uh, BCL2 overexpression. Um, and something we observe in Wallenstrom's and many other diseases, we can target that using venetoclax. Um, there are drugs that can target CXCR4 and block CXCR4 signaling. And we're using that to see if we can help improve the treatment outcomes for people with these CXCR4 mutations. And of course, we can block the ARACs. We didn't talk about it, but if they're still there and they're still signaling and they're not affected by BTK inhibition. And we're doing uh, research studies in the lab and uh, in model systems to try to understand uh, if we can improve the response to BTK therapy by combining it with ARAC inhibitors. And finally, of course, we have things like HCK and MAP kinase ERK inhibitors downstream of HCK that we're now bringing into the, uh, our studies and into our model systems. And we hope to be able to bring into the clinic once again to have better and improved therapies. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention one of the big breakthroughs from this year, which is that Steve Trion made an interesting connection, which is that in the cases of COVID, we actually observe people who get very, very sick. And part of the reason they have problems is all the immune cells are rushing to the lungs to try to fight off this infection. And this is actually what's causing the lung injury, the inability to breathe, and a lot of the, a lot of the problems that COVID-19 uh, patients face and that lead to hospitalization, ventilation, and sometimes death. Think about it. We have a source of inflammation and cells rushing to that source of inflammation, causing a problem, essentially, sort of like the bone marrow environment of Wallenstein's macroglobulinemia patients. And so Steve made this connection that ETK was actually playing a critical role, both in COVID and the problems associated with it, as well as in Wallenstrom's. And maybe we could use the BTK inhibition therapies that we've developed for Wallenstrom's to really uh, explore in a case of COVID-19. And uh, one of the sort of amazing things about working with Steve is he's not just the guy who makes a connection like this, but he's actually the guy who then gets on the phone, calls the FDA, gets the preliminary information together, gets it published, and actually starts clinical trials. So we actually have clinical trials for Brutinib and Xanabrutinib going on here in Boston, looking at the role of BTK inhibition therapy in patients who are hospitalized for COVID-19. So hopefully we'll have more on that soon, but we're all very, very proud of Steve and the work that he's doing. And we're all pulling together, not just to help with WM, but also um, with this pandemic. The other thing I'd like to talk about just briefly is what we call the 300 Project. And this was a massive effort on our part to bring together 300 untreated Wallenstein patients and look at the mutations in the DNA, the gene usage through the transcriptome, that's all the RNA that's being made at a given point in time, to look at the epigenomic states, both the chemical annotation and what sections of the DNA are open, and put this all together for, for a patient to really get a comprehensive map and understanding of what signaling is active and why in individual patients, and use that to really get a deep understanding of what makes Wallenstrom's macroglobulin tick, what makes people respond or not respond to certain therapies, and ultimately come up with better 
therapeutics and ultimately maybe even the cure. So I'll be talking more about our efforts there and how we're going about analyzing this in my next talk at the Educational Forum for IWMF. And I hope to see everyone there. Uh, but in the interim, again, feel free to reach out with any questions and I'd very much be happy to reply. And I'm looking forward to seeing all of you here in a few minutes for the question and answer session. I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, at least acknowledge all of the amazing support that we've gotten from the IWMF, from a number of uh, uh, really generous donations from the Bing Fund from WM, the International Wallenstrom's Macroglobulin Anemia Foundation, the, the Wallenstrom's Macroglobulin Anemia Foundation Canada, the Orzag Family Fund, the Coyote Fund, the Bailey Family Fund, the Zamato Fund, Leukemia Lymphoma Society, an NIH Sport Development Award, an Ash Scholar Award, a number of strategic roadmap grants, um, not to mention all the people at the Bing Center for Wall Instruments who've worked very, very hard to put this uh, data together, as well as our friends at the Jerome Lipper Multiple Myeloma Center. And of course, we wouldn't be anywhere without you uh, and your support and the, that of the WM community. So thanks again. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing you in the question and answer session, and I'm glad I can be with you at least virtually this year. Best wishes and see you soon.